know, we've talked a lot about big data in uh, the use and the service of making buildings more efficient and automobiles and machines more efficient. And uh, we talk about you know, how that saves energy and ultimately reduces environmental impact, which of course then has an impact on nature. But what about going directly to the source? What about the use of big data to save nature? And we're going to talk about that here with uh, uh, Gabi Zedelmeyer from HP and uh, M. Sanjan from uh, Conservation International. Um, so first of all, welcome them to the stage. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Joel. So Sanjan, let's talk about this partnership that, that CI, Conservation International, and right. HP is doing uh, to use data to save animals. Give us a little snapshot. So one of the hardest places on the planet to monitor, to look into, to peek under, if you will, is tropical rainforests. Um, you can't do it with aerial surveys very easily. You don't know what's happening underneath the canopy. And you can essentially have empty forests. Now, this is not a new idea. Lots of people do this. One of the things we started doing in 2002 is in a partnership with the Smithsonian Institution and Wildlife Conservation Society, we started deploying cameras in about 17 countries along with climate stations and sampling plots that would look at everything from carbon to temperature to radiation that's coming down, uh, solar radiation, and of course these traps, literally thousands of these cameras that sit there in the forest silently for months at a time, snapping pictures of what goes bump in the night. Now, what started as a fantastically fun thing to do in very, very inhospitable uh, regions like the Congo or in Suriname or in Indonesia quickly became a giant problem for us because this thing was so successful, we were getting such vast amounts of data that we had very little chance to make sense of it in any way that could inform the management of these areas in real time. And that's where our friends at HP came in. Well, this is where you come in, Gabi. Uh, what did you do and why did you do it? Yeah, so beforehand, I want to say we're really living at very exciting times and change is coming upon us quicker than we can even think about. Every day there are new business models. Every day it changes how we live and work. And I just read a new statistic that we produce as much information every 10 minutes now as we did from the beginning of mankind to 2003. Mm. It used to be two days, now it's 10 minutes soon. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's mind boggling. And just thinking about all of this information, as one of the largest IT companies in the world, we are not only looking at the most energy efficient platforms and infrastructures, but also what do we do with all of this data? How do we turn it into knowledge? How do we use structured and unstructured data and then analyze it, again, turn it into knowledge so that people actually can use it. And that's exactly what we've done with Conservation International. They've had all of this wonderful data from sensors and the camera traps that we just saw all of these selfies from these animals. Uh, it's, it's amazing. And it, it took them up to six months, and entire groups of researchers, to analyze their data. And all they were doing, in a way, was looking in the rearview mirror. And so by bringing our big data analytics platform, Vertica, which is a haven platform, to this issue, we're now able to do the same thing with one person in the course of one day. And all of the time can be spent on using the knowledge in solving the issues at hand. So for us, it's a, it's a phenomenal platform of the technology at the same time as we're addressing one of the big environmental issues. And is this uh, a philanthropy thing for you, or are you learning things? Does this have some business relevance to HP? Yeah, all of what we do in the social space and in the environmental space always has a number of different objectives. We certainly want to want to help address some of these issues, but at the same time there is a tremendous amount of learning and also a great opportunity to showcase our entire platform. A lot of people know us for a specific part of our business. You know, they say, oh yeah, great printers or great infrastructure, great this and that, but not many really know that we really focus on big data and have fantastic big data solutions or mobility solutions or cloud solutions or security solutions. So by doing this kind of work, we get to government officials, you know, policy makers, universities, 
uh, customers that are very interested in these topics and we can showcase technology at the same time as you know, we're addressing one of these big issues. Yeah. So and and, and, and uh, HP's contribution to us has not just been in giving us hardware and for the field, but also just teams of engineers who've literally created the tools that allow a field manager, say, in Uganda, um, to look at the data that not only he, his park has been collecting, but also look at data across the sites in Africa, or compare the sites in Africa versus what's going on in Asia. So it really has created this incredible network. As I said, six, 16 countries, um, about 275 species that are being monitored. These are vertebrates, so birds and mammals things that you will never spend your entire life going through the forest and never seeing, even once, are being looked at and monitored using these, um, these tools, um, along with 60,000 trees. So you can go down to the sort of individual level where you can look at tree growth in one plot, like how fast is this tree growing over time? But you can also scale that back because we have climate data, because we're collecting carbon sink data, like how much carbon is captured within this one hectare plot of land, for example. And we're doing, um, using Landsat and others, we're also doing remote sensing data. So it's combining all these levels of data from individual photos of an individual animal all the way to Landsat imagery. You get an incredible picture of a part of the world that really is hidden otherwise. So talk a little bit about, Sanjan, how this <clears throat> helps you in your mission at CI. That is, what happens, what are you able to do as a result of having what I think you described as taking the immeasurable and making it measurable? Maybe that was one of you, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. um, so you're, you're able to do this and, and aggregate all of this data. What, how does that translate into actual on the ground action. campaigns, efforts, actions? Sure, so look, the CI is built on a very simple premise, that is people need nature to survive. I mean, that's the raison d'etre for our organization. We believe that when you understand that your lives are directly influenced by nature, then the reasons for saving nature will really be self-serving. They'll be the reasons for saving nature is because you're saving yourselves. And we think that's true whether you live in San Francisco or it's true, maybe even more true, if you live uh, in a tropical forest or if you live very close to nature in a physical way in Madagascar, Suriname, or Indonesia. Now, to do that, you need loads of tools, but one of the things you need to understand is how much value nature is providing to local communities, how much local communities are influencing nature and its ability to thrive. Now, in these very remote, hard to survey places, using remote sensing, whether it's a camera or whether it's Landsat, is the way to go. Ultimately, this data gets aggregated into the kind of tools that will allow people to make these sorts of decisions. For example, very real example, Bewindi impenetrable forest. If you want to go see gorillas, there are just a few places you can go do that. You can do it in Rwanda, you can also do it in Uganda. If you go to Bewindi, it's a phenomenal place. It, this is not a place that has a large economy in, it, in its own right, but one of the big drivers of its economy are tourists who will pay top dollar to come in there and hike these trails in order to see a gorilla. Now the park manager there loves this because it's a steady source of income. But that activity is having an effect on other animals that live in the forest. For example, carnivores that live in the forest, like a golden cat. It's a cat that you will never see in a thousand trips out there, but they live there, they're endangered, and they avoid the trails that the tourists tend to use. Now, we only know that because these cameras have been providing that information. Now, getting that information to that park manager is essential. He can now move his tourist activities or influence them in such a way or time them in such a way as to minimize disturbance on other critically threatened species for which there is little economic value. There is no economic value for him, but it's still important to protect. At a bigger scale, look, let's think about logging, or let's think about a new road coming in, or let's think about um, watershed use. So when you aggregate the scale into a region, now you can see how a watershed might be able to influence, for example, a, a, um, a village that lives downstream, or how much reforestation efforts in a park might be adding to the carbon budget of the park. So you, know, you can go from a very small decision that one guy is making in one place to a decision that a community or even a government, like the government of Peru is making in how it's promoting its national parks using this kind of data. Again, because the data scales so beautifully. Yeah. 
Gabby, what's involved from a hardware and technology, uh, software technology perspective? Is this expensive to do something like this, particularly in a remote location? Uh, or is this something that is kind of you just drop in any, from anywhere? So what we're doing is we're providing the IT infrastructure to do all of the data analytics um, with our servers, as well as really bringing the software platforms. As I mentioned before, we brought, uh, first of all, the structured data analytics, because a lot of this is structured data. But then we also said, now let's take a look at these pictures and how you can actually identify what exactly you see. And again, if you have millions and millions of images, this takes a long time. So we also brought in the unstructured uh, part of the business with autonomy. So it's really across our entire um, big data analytics platform, uh, not only a showcase, but it really enables us to analyze this data um, and, and change, uh, as I said, really the conversation. So for us, a great technology. Show. So for, for, and, for and, and, and it's of server course, time largely. We also, we also have the, the, the we also have a lot of the hardware, um, the the laptops and tablets out there in order to capture some of the data. And as we look forward, you know, we can combine a lot of this data also with publicly available data, and that really makes the beauty when you combine even more video material or man-made material or machine-made material information all into the same sort of uh, analytics set in order to drive uh, to solutions, in order to come up with really new ways of tackling some of these issues. Yeah. And just to give you a scale, I mean, we're talking of over two million photographs. So it's, it's pretty large, and they're coming from very remote parts of the, of the planet that you would have no other way of, of looking at, along with literally you know, hundreds and hundreds of climate sensors that are stationed throughout the forest as well. Yeah. Well, how does this change the way we do science? I think really big data changes everything. It doesn't only change the way we do science, it changes the way we run our operations from our, our own operations to our supply chain to how we design, manufacture, and go to market with our products. It changes everything fundamentally, and it's also not industry specific. It holds for every industry. If I'm, if I'm a doctor and I, I'm seeing a patient and I see certain symptoms and I have availability of data around the world with patients with similar symptoms, I can be much more precise in my assessment and also avoid a lot of waste in the system. If I'm a a cab driver and I get analytics that show me not only what's going on in the city, when are people taking breaks, you combine that with the latest weather forecast, I can be in the right spot right 10 minutes before it starts to rain in order to pick up customers and take them to a different venue. It's As this all comes together, it changes the way we do business right. every day. So I get that, but let's talk, I want to I I come back to that for implications for a lot of these companies, but let's talk about the science for a second. Yeah, so look, a lot of this is you know what we used to call sort of bucket science. It's really simple stuff. But the challenge is it, you cannot scale it because, you know, when you have teams in Colombia or you have teams in Peru or you have teams in the Congo, you know, it's village by village, community by community in very, very remote places. I used to do this work myself in my graduate work, right? Part of that work involved taking cameras out in the field and putting them to capture animals that you're trying to survey. Now, so that was in late 19, like so 1999, 2000. Now at that time, one individual could probably manage about 20 cameras. That was a, a lot of cameras to put out there. So I'd go out there and put these cameras. They wouldn't work very well. They'd you know, trigger for the wrong reasons. You know, a couple would get eaten by a lion. The batteries, I mean, this is very, very real. They, they absolutely, this, hate this happens. Hate when that happens. Yeah, yeah, hate when that happens. You see like a mouth and then <laughs> that's it. And then you have, you know, and then, and then they batteries die. And so you're checking them every day. It's exhaustive. And then you come back and you actually have to develop the film. Remember? You have to like drive to like Windhoek if I was in Namibia and then go to the one Kodak shop and they develop the film. And then a few weeks later, I'd have like 30 photos. That's it. And then I had to write some paper about it. And that was it. That for that one location, that was it. And I wanted to do it in another location. It takes another person like me, and so on and so on and so forth. The technology has jumped in the sense that now cameras can last for months. You can deploy them very quickly. The triggers are much, much better, even though I'm still not happy with them. So you can do that. But you still have a fundamental problem, which is how do you get, you still can't scale. So the only way you can scale is when you use a platform like this. I mean, what the power this allows you to do is have literally hundreds of people all doing a micro experiment, which can then be, which you can step back and look at the macro pattern. 
And I think that is so, so exciting. It allows community science. It allows citizen science. It allows community science. Very little training, but still part of a global network. I mean, that's why we call it TEAM. Um, it, it obviously stands for Tropical Ecology Assessment and Monitoring. But it's also TEAM because it is a collection of people who are kind of putting this together. Yeah. And it, it is the most exciting thing when you hear a manager in India talk about what's going on in Madagascar. I mean, that, you, you know, you get chills because now you're really starting to see global patterns. Yeah. So, Gabi, what's the implications for supply chain? So, we have uh, people in these room, big companies that have pretty big supply chains. And one of the things, as you well know, in supply chains and HP is supply chain as well, is this idea of, of transparency and traceability, chain of custody if you're sourcing, uh, whether it's minerals or forestry or or uh, even natural gas, and, and where does it come from, and who makes it, the labor issues, and all that. Does this technology, how does that enable uh, changing that way of doing that and ensuring and allowing the kind of transparency that now is being demanded? Yeah, it, as, I, as I said already, I do think that one of the big phenomenal uh, uh, differences is, first of all, the volume, the amount of information that you can now analyze at, at you know unprecedented rates, but it's also the variety. There is so much going on in your supply chain, and in the past you will have had maybe siloed analytics for different pieces, but now you can bring all of that together, which is very different again. And then the speed at which you can do this. So again, whether it's your own operation or whether it's the supply chain, um, or whether it's the products or solutions, you're now dealing with knowledge and not with sort of gut feel or experience over years where you do some kind of an extrapolation. The future is very different. As I said, you know, it's unprecedented uh, a speed that, that everything is changing. And with this type of analytic platform, you can actually get down to the bottom of it. And I think one of the uh, pieces also when it comes to the research, which is something that we hadn't seen is, at HP, we have an operating framework that's called Living Progress, and that really focuses on driving um, health progress with human progress, economic progress through education, and then environmental progress, and how that all comes together. Because there is not a single environmental issue that you can research that doesn't have a health aspect to it, yeah. um, and that you can change through education. So all of that is coming together and you can do sort of overall analytics. And a lot of the learnings that we get from the environmental field, we can really apply in the health space, in the education space, or any place yeah. else. Yeah, and, and it also changes the way you all communicate to the world about this. Uh, there's I think that's one of the fundamentals here as well. We've, we've talked about the technology, but what we've also done is we've brought this to an easy to use user interface. Because if it's all kinds of data that's sitting on some sort of a server that nobody can use, then it's something that HP can share with Conservation International and that'll be the end of it. But we created a wildlife picture index that any of you can have access to, anybody can access this You can data. look at it right now. It's called Wildlife Picture Index. If you just Google that, you'll Google find that it. and find it. And, and, and it'll show you exactly what is going on, as, as we described earlier, in any of these parts of the world. So people can now now, take the information, come together, and come work on the solutions. And I think that is important as anything else. Yeah, and, and that it, picture index is fairly sophisticated in that it's not just looking at what we take, but it also accounts for, you know, if, a, if you don't take a picture of an animal, does it mean the animal doesn't exist, or does it mean that your camera didn't capture it? So it's a statistical problem. So it, it incorporates that level of sophistication, giving you an index for, you know, leopards in a forest in Africa. And you can look at that almost real time on your laptop uh, wow. right now. You could actually answer that if a tree falls in the forest question. You, you could. At least 60,000 <laughs> 60, <laughs> trees whole new dimension. that have been looked at. Exactly. Oh, this is exciting. So I want to show this, sure. uh, this great uh, video series. I'm not sure how many of you have seen this uh, Nature is Listening series. That, uh, Nature's Speaking. Nature's Speaking, Nature's speaking. series. All right. and, and listening, but there's Nature's Speaking uh, that, uh, that the CI put together with uh, Julia Roberts, uh, Harrison Ford, Kevin Spacey, Ed Norton, Penelope Cruz, uh, Robert Redford. Um, it's really an extraordinary, powerful, and we're going to show. I think it's the uh, it's the Harrison Ford one. Oh uh, no, I think it, I think uh, we're Kevin doing Spacey. the rainforest, rainforest one, Kevin which is with yeah. Well, so so okay. the rainforest. So this this was done by um, Media Arts Lab. Lee Klaus, so the creative genius behind the Apple ads, helped put this thing together, and it's voiced by amazing talent. The rainforest one is appropriate because we're talking about tropical rainforest right now, and you know Kevin Spacey has this sort of Francis. 
you know, Underwoodsian sort of sarcasm <laughs> to it, which is brilliant. Yeah. But the reason I want you guys to watch it, and please do this because watch you can all actually of them. help watch us. All of them. So the big question is how do we fund this work that we do with team and these cameras? Well, you can actually help fund this. If you tweet or share or retweet, hashtag nature is speaking, that's one word, hashtag nature is speaking, these guys at HP have to give us one dollar <laughs> for this We product. want to give them one dollar, <laughs> but each time it comes from an individual so handle. Please, so keep retweeting, dollars. hashtag nature Everybody. speaking. It will really help get these videos out to people, but yeah. more importantly, it will help fund this work. And we have the big data analytics to check whether something yeah. happened afterwards yeah. today. Okay. So we can so. tell whether we had a bump from you guys. So Danny, can we roll that uh, video? Some call me nature. Others call me mother nature. I've been here for over four and a half billion years. 22,500 times longer than you. I don't really need people, but people need me. Yes, your future depends on me. When I thrive, you thrive. When I falter, you falter. Or worse. But I've been here for eons. I have fed species greater than you, and I have starved species greater than you. My oceans, my soil, my flowing streams, my forests, they all can take you or leave you. How you choose to live each day, whether you regard or disregard me, doesn't really matter to me, one way or the other. Your actions will determine your fate, not mine. I am nature. I will go on. I am prepared to evolve. Are you? Yeah. Obviously so, not so, yeah, Kevin so Spacey. That was then. Kevin Spacey after the operation. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, that was Julia. That was Julia Roberts. My favorite one is the Harrison Ford doing the ocean. The ocean. So he gave me chills. Yeah. We're at the end, and I don't think I'm giving it away because you'll see it, and you'll still get. The, I, I hope uh, the same chills I did, where he says in his gravelly Harrison yeah. Ford way, which I won't attempt to imitate, says, I once covered the world in water. Yeah. I can do I can it do again. It again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The pissed off ocean. Damn it. Huh. Yeah. Um, so you can see all those films at naturespeaking.org. But if you share those films or tweet it, um, again, we get funded for our camera work around the world. So let's set the uh, Verge world uh, raising a million dollars for uh, CI's work. That would be an awesome thing to do. So wh where does this go? Wh what's your hope for this project? Because uh, I'm sure there, as the technology evolves, as your experience with it evolves, you must have ideas about what you get to do now. Well, one thing that uh, Gabby and I were talking this morning, and I think it has a lot of potential, is there's still one bottleneck in this, um, this whole system of creating this monitoring, sort of an earth monitoring system uh, for hard to reach geographies like tropical forests. And that is the identification part of those photos, right? So those photos still need to be identified. And you can imagine how HP and others can help provide tools that can help make that automated. But you can also think of a crowd sort of sourced method as well, where those photos are involving the community in helping to identify and secure what species we're seeing and even identify individual animals, which will help you give population trends. So that's another step that we can take from there, and that's something that we and others will be looking forward to. There's also lots of other people currently who are using this kind of monitoring system. Um, you know, uh, other organizations like ZSL, uh, Zoological Society of London, or Panthera and others. We want them to be part of this network because it is open source right now, essentially. You can look at that data yourself. Yeah, I'm sure there's a network effect where the more participate, the exactly. more information, exactly. the more you That's... can do. Uh, Elaine, let's uh, take a question from out there. 
Yeah, so um, a bunch of questions just related to um, how it can extend to the business community. So your work is really engaging and a lot of buzz here. And thank you for, for this Nature Speaking campaign. It's really compelling. Um, but we're also noting that Conservation International does a lot of work with agriculture companies. And so is there an opportunity to share this information with those kinds of businesses or maybe even other businesses um, that can benefit from this species saving data work? Sure, absolutely. So that's the, um, so, so ag, if you especially think about places like Africa, you have about 230 million smallholder farmers. We have a big project called Vital Signs. It relies on individual data that we collect community by community, literally household by household in certain countries in Africa, like in southern Tanzania. It perfectly lends itself to big data analytics to really understand those patterns. So everywhere we work, whether it's with the mining timber industry, with water, with agriculture in particular, or fisheries, the, the ability to collect data locally but then look at that pattern globally is where I think the next big jump is going to be. Yeah, and we'll always make it available. I mean, that, that was from the start. We said this has to be information that everybody can have access to and everybody can use for the greater good. Yeah, another question? Yeah, so another question is about um, business model scaling. So you're talking about the challenges of scaling in general, um, but how does a company or any organization outside of the big budgets of HP sort of scale this business model kind for it to kind of work for them? Like, how can we replicate this work or, you know, just in terms of scaling the movement and, and really saving more ecosystems? I think, you know, when we uh, look at partners and choose partners, we always take a look at scaling. That's one of our first questions, and this is why we decided to partner here with Conservation International, because first of all, they have a global footprint, um, and second of all, we understood that, you know, we have a common goal here. So I think in general, the important piece is partnerships, again, and we've heard that before, but I think we really need to work on making these the most efficient and effective they can be. Partnerships are it. Nobody can tackle any of these issues by themselves, but with the technology that we have available today between what you can do with cloud analytics, combine it with mobility, you have an enabler at your hand to scale that you've never, ever exactly. had before. Never in history have we had that chance to scale. It's an enabler. It will take a lot of work on the ground, knowledge, people, but with these type of tools, we can really literally change the, 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 the game for sure. Yeah. Well, this is an incredible and terrific example of, of two leadership organizations doing what a true partnership is, which is that you know, things that you can do together that neither of you could do alone. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, no way. And, and 89 other small organizations around the world who are providing this data and being part of team as well. Yeah. So, so, so um, uh, nature is speaking, but thank you for- Nature for, speaking, for, please, you know, hashtag that. Hashtag that, yes, but thank please. you for being a part of this. Thanks so much. Thank you.